Hello everyone, today we're tackling one of the central fallacious claims that creationists attribute to evolution. So, let's jump right in. Many creationists say that while they accept small-scale evolution, they don't accept macroevolution on the basis that nobody has ever seen anything turn into something else that's completely different, and they often put emphasis on their undefined notion of kinds to make this argument. However, does the theory of evolution entail that organisms produce new ones that are so different such that they are no longer a member of the category from which they descended? For example, could dogs eventually evolve into things that are no longer dogs? The answer is no. There you go. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Oh, you're, you're still here? Well, Alright, I guess I'll explain why then. Every offspring is a slightly modified member of a population. In all organisms, mutations occur during DNA replication, even in clonal organisms. And in eukaryotic organisms, recombination occurs among DNA sequences, both processes of which alter your genetic makeup. As sexually reproducing organisms, each of us is endowed with a unique combination of alleles from our parents, and by the time you're a zygote, you already have over 100 novel mutations. These combined make you different genetically from your parents, their parents from their parents, and so on. These changes between parents and offspring are of course relatively subtle, such that the offspring is still a member of the same species. But wait, if every offspring is still the same species as the parent, how do new species arise, one might ask? Well, evolutionary change is not exactly defined by differences that occur between parents and offspring. Instead, it's defined as the change that occurs at the level of an entire interbreeding population or populations over generations. These population level changes include the differences that occur between parents and offspring that were previously mentioned, but not exclusively. Evolution is also a matter of how genetic variations spread throughout a population or are lost from the gene pool. This is where mechanisms such as selection, drift, and migration come in. It's the reason why evolution is often defined as a change in allele frequencies within a population over time. How do these changes produce new species? Well, to simplify an otherwise very complex process, when a population splits into two that are genetically isolated from each other, Unique changes that occur in one population do not occur in the other. Each individual change is subtle, often barely noticeable, but these accumulate in each population, gradually making them increasingly more distinct over time. As we've mentioned numerous times on this channel, differences can build up in those closely related populations until they are no longer able to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. This is the basis of speciation and by extension macroevolution. But nowhere in this process did one parent give birth to something of a different species. If this is still difficult to understand, a good analog to this process is the development of languages. When someone takes a course in Spanish after they've already learned how to speak French, that person will very likely notice some uncanny resemblances between them. This is not a coincidence. These, as well as a few other languages such as Italian, Romanian, and Portuguese, all descended from Latin. Although there was never a time when a couple of Latin-speaking parents had one child that grew up speaking Spanish and one speaking French. Just like with evolving populations, languages change slowly at the population level. Subtle changes in pronunciation, word usages, etc. that occur within different isolated communities, building up over time giving rise to different dialects and eventually separate languages that are no longer mutually intelligible. This is very similar to how new species evolve, but what about higher taxa such as families and phyla? How do these arise? For new species we need speciation, but do we need some higher form of evolution to get new families? The fact is that there isn't really a quote higher form of evolution than speciation. Let's say we start with a single species. After several rounds of speciation events, we end up with a set of daughter species, each slightly different in varying degrees from the progenitor and each other. We could give this group the rank of family, but what if we let the same process repeat itself for each daughter species? Now we end up having multiple families, each slightly different from their respective progenitor species, but more different than the primary progenitor. 
Now we have to give the entire group a higher rank, even though all it started with was a single species. The fact is that the Linnaean ranks are very subjective. They only make sense when you apply them to just extant organisms. But when we proceed further back in time, the vast differences that we associate between different families or classes become more and more blurred. Take for example the two groups, reptiles and birds. Both of these were given the rank of class in the Linnaean system. In the present world, the closest relatives to birds are crocodiles, which are reptiles with many differences from birds so it makes sense to put both in different classes. However, if we look in the fossil record, as we did in the Dinosaur Phylogeny series, specifically during the episodes on theropods and aviale, we see many creatures that don't fit within either the reptile or bird category, as defined by their extant members. Theropod dinosaurs aren't much like modern reptiles. They stand erect, walk bipedally, and have many other features typical of birds, such as hollow bones, furcula, plumage, etc., and early avialians aren't much like modern birds because they had a mouth full of teeth instead of a beak, a long bony tail, unfused fingers, no keeled sternum, etc. So in order for the Linnaean system to work, we need to expand the definitions of these classes. Now reptiles do include theropods and birds, include early avialians. But as a result of expanding these definitions, the differences between birds and reptiles are no longer that significant. Under the Linnaean system, Archaeopteryx and Balar are part of the bird class among penguins and hummingbirds, but Zhen Yen Hualong and Microraptor are part of the reptile class among crocodiles, lizards, and snakes. This clearly doesn't make much sense. If we had just these four creatures, we would classify them in the same order or even the same family, based on the fact that they aren't very different from one another. Such awkward situations are the reason why the Linnaean classification has largely fallen out in favor of cladistics. In this system, every valid grouping is defined as a clade, which follows the rules of evolution. One of the central rules is the principle, or law, of monophyly. As lineages proceed following a split, they do become more and more dissimilar genetically from each other and their ancestors, but they will still remain part of their ancestral lineage. Even in rare instances when a lineage speciates in a single generation, due to such forces as polyploidy, that offspring is still just a slightly modified form of the parental stock. This is actually how every clade began, as a slightly modified version of its ancestral lineage, barely distinct from its ancestors and any closely related sister species. Now the previous observation makes sense. There are little differences between Archaeopteryx, Balar, Zhen Yen Hualong, and Microraptor because birds began a slightly modified subset of theropod dinosaurs, and as a consequence of monophyly, birds are still a subset of theropod dinosaurs. The large differences that we associate with higher Linnaean ranks are thus the result of numerous modifications being repeatedly compiled on top of each other, and these modifications are represented by a long series of clades. This same process has been going on for billions of years, so whether or not you accept the fact that the age of the planet is 4.5 billion years and that life appeared about 4 billion years ago, you must understand that this is how evolution is claimed to happen. Thus, when a lineage evolves a new structure, such as a cellular nucleus or lungs or tetrapod limbs, the descendants must have, by necessity, modified and built upon pre-existing structures. In the case of tetrapod limbs, these were gradually adapted from sarcopterygian fish fins into load-bearing limbs. This was obviously not instantaneous as the transition is represented by several clades. To summarize this in a few bite-sized steps, the clade Tetrapodomorpha was a slightly modified subset of sarcopterygii. One of the modifications that defines this clade is how the fins contained a humerus bone that articulates with the socket of a shoulder bone. This was followed by the clade Epistostegalia, wherein the bones inside the fins formed a radius and an ulna, as well as a humerus. And then, Stegocephalia modified the little bones that supported rays of fins into the digits supporting eight toes in total. However, in the subsequent clade of Tetrapoda, some of these were lost, establishing the tetrapod standard of no more than five digits on each limb. At no point did a fish magically develop an arm. The arm was evolved in incremental steps, and from then on every descendant was and will be a tetrapod, even if their limbs were lost later on, as is the case with snakes and cetaceans. Regarding this specific question, would dogs produce non-dogs according to evolution? Again, no, the law of monophyly would forbid such a thing. 
dogs would produce dogs in the same way wolves produce wolves, and dogs are still a subset of wolves, just like snakes and cetaceans are still tetrapods. Of course, when you explain it like this to a creationist, they will probably say that the dog kind includes wolves, jackals, coyotes, and perhaps even foxes as well. However, even if you define dogs to include all canids, the answer is still the same. All the descendants of the canid clade will always remain canids. Even if canids would, in the very distant future, give rise to creatures that are as diverse as birds are today, containing members that are as different from each other as penguins are from hummingbirds, that future canid group would perhaps be given the rank of class under the Linnaean system. But all of these future descendants would still be members of the canid clade nonetheless. But, creationists say, what about their ancestors? Do you believe dogs came from non-dogs? That's not a problem since monophyly is a one-way street. And it is not like dogs evolved from any random non-dog. Dogs evolved from a specific line of carnivorans. The earliest carnivorans were the meocids, the common ancestors of both dogs and cats. Although the term meocid by its traditional usage is paraphyletic, a leftover from the Linnaean classification system. According to cladistics, every extant carnivoran is a meocid. Anyway, this early group of carnivorans diverged into the Feliformes, the cat-like carnivorans, and the Caniformes, the dog-like carnivorans, the latter of which obviously includes dogs. The earliest Caniformes were the Amphicyonids, aka bear dogs, not to be confused with Hemicyonids, or dog bears, which were a lineage of dog-like carnivorans closely related to bears. Amphicyonids included the very Meocid-like Gustafsonia and Angelarctosion, and as they were previously assigned to the genus Measis. Other early carnivorans, such as Lycophocyon, were basal to the canoids, which divided into Arctoidea and Canidae. The former would eventually lead to bears, pinnipeds, i.e. the seals, and mustiloids, while the latter were the earliest dogs in the broad sense of the word. But these early canids weren't exactly like the ones we have today. Hesperocyon, one of the earliest canids discovered so far, was transitioning from plantigrade locomotion, walking on the whole foot like bears, to digitigrade locomotion, walking on its toes like modern dogs, with their heels and vestigial dewclaw being held above the ground. This made canids fast runners, able to hunt down prey. Apart from the early extinct Hesperocyoninae branch, there was another extinct branch of canids called Borophaginae. This clade began with fox-sized canids, such as Archaeocyon, but some of the later members became large, bone-crushing predators, such as Epicyon. After these became extinct, the last remaining branch of canids, called Caninae, took over, beginning with fox-sized creatures such as Leptocyon. These would later give rise to all the canids we still have today. The jackals, coyotes, wolves, and their domesticated descendants we all enjoy, as well as the various species of foxes. So there you have it. At no point during the evolution of dogs, nor anything else for that matter, did something change into something else that was completely different. The earliest carnivorans gave rise to the earliest caniformes, which in turn gave rise to the first canids. And all of these are still part of the clades from which they descended. Canids are still caniformes, as well as carnivorans and placental mammals, vertebrates, eukaryotes, you get the point. And whether canids will give rise to more clades in the very distant future remains to be seen. However, we know that none of these hypothetical daughter clades would qualify as non-canids, nor non-conivorans, nor non-placentals, nor non-eukaryotes. Again, you get the point. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.